Is time a dimension? No. Why is she wrong? She's wrong because laws are not timeless. The metaphor she's using, if she were a modern character, Stoppard would write her saying, if you were really, really clever and you could measure the positions of all the atoms and the states of all the atoms, you could write a computer program to emulate their evolution in time. And inputting the initial state which you measured, you could output all of the motions and all of the future story of the atoms. And that is the basic method of physics that um, I call physics in a box or the Newtonian paradigm. And it's exactly the right thing to do for small regions of space and time. But it doesn't take into account the fact that, or the fact, the possibility that laws of nature are not stable and evolve and therefore that the future will diverge from what you would predict with um, static laws. Time is nothing like a dimension of space. We have a choice of where we go in space within reason. We can go to the left, to the right, backwards, forwards, up and down. We have no choice about where we are in time or how we're moving in time. Um, Leibniz developed a philosophy of nature called relationalism now, according to which positions and motions, times, the general phenomena of space and time are not absolute. There's no such thing as an absolutely where something is and when something happens. All these things are aspects of relationships, and he has a metaphysical vision. Time for him is at the order of events that happen. It's a relational concept. If nothing happened, if there was no change, there would be no time for Leibniz. And space is an organization of these relationships or a condensation or averaging of the relationships, which becomes a useful description at some point, but is not fundamental. The world is just a network of relationships like that, and space is an emergent property the way the temperature or density of is our emergent properties. But there's an implication of Leibniz's philosophy, which he called the principle of the identity of the indiscernible. That if you have two things or two events which have the same network of relationships to the rest of the universe, they're the same. And this means that every two entities in the universe must be unique, must be distinguishable from every other. Every two events must be unique and distinguishable from every other. And this is very interesting. This, this gives a big challenge to our standard way of thinking about physics, what I call physics in a box, in which we emphasize what's repeatable. And it really makes a challenge to invent a new methodology in which what's repeatable will only, can only be at a level of approximate description. And if you're going to make the whole description, then you're going to find that every two events, every two particles are unique in all their properties. Usually the fact that experiments in quantum physics are repeatable and you always get the same distribution of answers, is put down to the timelessness of the laws of nature. But here's a different hypothesis that explains the same phenomenon, but has different ramifications. What if there's no law of nature, except that if a system is posed with a question, it looks back and asks, has a similar system been posed with a similar question in the past? And there'll be a, a set of cases where that occurred, we're going to call those the precedents. And then it just takes randomly one of them and gives the answer that was given before in that case in the past. So that will, that will reproduce the same probability distributions as occurred in the past. 
and it doesn't require us to believe in timeless laws of nature acting from the outside. One can make new quantum states which have never existed before in nature, which have properties that have never existed before. And one can do this by making entangled states for many particle systems. And if the principle of precedence is right, then these would not obey the usual laws of quantum mechanics put together by knowing the forces between the parts. The point of view that I develop about time in the book is one in which Part of the meaning of the reality of time is that everything that is real is real in the moment of time, including any general laws and generalized behaviors. They're just aspects of the present state of the world and are subject to change as well. And the future does not exist, the future is not real. I think that this point of view, if I step out of side of physics, allows the possibility of genuine novelty in nature, 